see George, who's not the guest I expected. Actually, I see George's... That, that's okay, I'm confused, but you are delightful. There are so many superheroes, <laughs> so many. This is fabulous. I'm going to see if I can give you more of my screen. So hold on just a second while I make you bigger because you, you need to be bigger. It is simply that simple. Um, so many options on my screen of how to do this. None of them do I like. All right. Okay. I'm going to make myself tiny. I am now tiny. I'm going to take your window. We can't see you at all. I can fix that. Okay. Now everyone yeah, can it's... see all of us, including my green screen, which is not green screening. Um, okay. So I'm going to fix things one fix at a time. Why do I have no audio on the window I want to be using? These are the things that leave me confused. But can someone do a voice check? Hello, hello. Okay, that worked. Hello. All right, I have all of you on screen. I still don't have my green screen working, working on that. So oh my girl, say you... something. <laughs> what was that? I said, Comet Girl, say something. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. And can you introduce yourselves? You are amazing. <laughs> so <laughs> my real life name is Jancy McPhee, but my superhero persona is I'm Volta. And I am... My superpower is all about creativity and I'm interested in science and also engaging the world about science and coming up with really amazing solutions to our future space challenges. So great I, to be here, love this. meeting you. Hi, I am Georgiana Kramer, I'm, um, but I'm also known as the lunatic phenomenon. And I, am, uh, I study the moon back and front, inside and out. And my whole goal is to is for humankind to go to the moon and then to Mars and colonize the solar system and take over the galaxy. I approve. Um, I approve. <laughs> go ahead. Hi, I'm Asma Bujibar and my persona is Anvil Girl. My superpower is to create the very high pressure and temperature whenever planets collide and grow in the lab. So I try to understand how do we go from a solar nebula into big planets and what all reactions happen during the whole process. Well, hello, I'm Queenie Chan and I'm the Comet Girl. I do have a very special power, which is I have laser that fire out from my eyes. Unfortunately, that uh, I just burned my eyes today, so you can see a bit of like burned aura around my eyes. But that's just a little accident. It's fine. I'm fine now. So my work is to uh, so obviously I come from a comet, and uh, Earth is the first time that I found life other than than comet, and I'm all alone on comet. So it's pretty fascinating and I really want to investigate into how come how life come to come to here and what's the origin of life so this is what my my, my um, investigation is going on please tell me how the group of you came to form your science league of awesome <laughs> Well, I, I guess that we um, we have a passion for science. We have a passion for inspiring people, and we have these superpowers. So it just really became obvious that we needed to gather together and, and make a form of science league, um, so that we could save the world from ignorance. And we want everybody to know about all the amazing, cool things that we're doing in space, and we want to invite them to join us in that incredible future that we have ahead of us. We need everybody to contribute, and whether they're scientists and engineers, space scientists, yes. doctors, and artists. science and art. Exactly, so everything. And uh, we're looking forward to helping to inspire other people to come join us and do this amazing next phase of exploration. 
Yes. And the cool thing is, we each of us got a special interest in very different fields. So it's fascinating that we could get to learn from each other something about the moon, something something about the middle of the planet, and something about the origin of life. So it's amazing that we could get together and share with people what we know and what we're interested in to know. Now, and don't forget, we need to keep those people healthy as they go on further. So we need to learn a lot about what happens to people when they go further into space and how we can protect them. Now, now, some of you, Comet Girl, you knew from early on that you were special because you originated <laughs> out in the space between worlds. Did, did all of you have this same kind of a lonely origin story or did you come into your powers through some fabulous laboratory accident or <laughs> adolescence triggered them? How did you find out you are a superhero? So actually, so my superpower came by a freak accident of several years of study and hard work. Um, and, uh, and then my superpower did, it came to be. And, and, you know, I had a calling that some people almost like mistook for maybe evil because, you know, I really wanted us to, you know, I want to, I want, I want us to, to, to take over the galaxy. Right. But I want to use my powers for good per se. <laughs> It, yeah, it I just covered. I Go just covered my superpower by touching anything, and I, I was touching. It was turning into diamond. <laughs> that especially is... people. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> Can I say any, anything? I was touching. Oh my god! I, I turned things into <laughs> diamond. What is going on here? And mm. then I was touching a meteorite. I'm turning to a planet. I was like, okay, wow. And so that that was like, yeah, every day I make a planet in the lab and I get to understand how each planet is different and maybe why do we have life on Earth and not in on Mercury, maybe on Mars. And so by spending hours in the lab, hours, nights and weekends, I just I was like, oh my God, I'm getting this superpower growing. And yeah, and so this was something that I wanted to show people and especially like not saying I'm in transforming all of this, this nights into a power that is just bigger than anything you can dream of, right? At your sleep, can you actually dream of making planets and you can do it for real? So... I love that superpowers can come from hard work because that means all of us maybe have that potential. Not everyone will have the potential, but maybe some of us who don't realize we have the potential. If we work hard enough and long enough, maybe we can join your ranks. That, that's actually one of the reasons why we've come together as the female superheroes of science is we want to send that message that it's it's up to you to make a decision of and and learn through hard work and overcoming your personal challenges and realizing that inside of every one of us is a superpower you just need to recognize it and not be afraid and to use it to do amazing things i I studied neuroscience, so I'm very interested in the cells and molecules that allow people to think and move and create and have certain behaviors. And then I was lucky enough to be able to study how those things are altered during long duration space missions. But I also realized that there's so many things that we still don't understand and that my hidden superpower is to encourage other people to come join us and to find their own superpower. We love to talk to people of all ages, girls and boys and people with different backgrounds and encourage them to get as excited as we are about space and be a part of it. Now, some of the bigger superheroes, those who have banded up for like the League of Legends, the Justice League, the X-Men, all these different groups of city destroying superheroes. It's easy to find out about them because people have bothered to like tell their stories in movies and comic books and graphic novels. But you guys, in some cases, are the real heroes. And we don't 
hear about you nearly as much as we should. How can people learn more about the stuff that you guys are doing to help not just save humanity, but progress it into the future? Well, I, I think uh, we can start by encouraging people to join us on our Facebook page and to become a superhero. We want to make this not just a, a small group of people and and but a really large group, you know, across the country, across the world, everybody coming together to do these amazing things together and help each other find their own superpowers and for their own community. Right, exactly. Because it's it's this next phase of space phases of space exploration are really something we'd like to do together as much as possible. You know, if only those superheroes that got these, you know, fantastic movies and their stories told, if only they used that money to fund a space mission, yeah. which, you know, some of those movies could have funded four missions or yes. a really, really big flagship mission like Cassini. Um, uh, we would know so much more and we would probably have colonized the solar system by now. And And that brings up a really good point. A lot of people disparage the fact that we have billionaires out there building spacecraft but at the same time we know that our government won't and i well i mean they do they just don't build them in the same numbers um i i once read this study on how if every time a new apple device came out you had invested the amount in Apple stocks that you had invested in purchasing the Apple products, you would be a multimillionaire because of the way Apple stocks have increased in prices over the years. Most people don't do that. I have an Apple book, uh, an Apple Mac I thing on my desk. <laughs> it goes. It's 9-9. Nine nine. That's all I know. Um, I don't have any stock. I have retirement savings. I'm not going to like die. But I never made that investment in my future when I made that investment in my now. When we look at the entertainment industry, that's another investment in the moment where where these big corporations are spending all sorts of money to create something that in many cases is a transitory thing. Most movies don't linger in history to be rewatched. Superman 1 stood out as one of the better superhero movies ever made. But there's some Batman movies that are best never revisited. And let's not talk about the rest of the DC universe. <laughs> Imagine if all that money had, had been spent not just to create the movies, but then reinvested in parallel actual research. If, if gamma ray science was given money every time a Spider-Man movie was made. Mm -hmm. Occasionally we'll have people reach out to us with astronomy cast with cosmic quest and say, Hey, we have this new TV show, this new movie, this new thing coming out in exchange for promoting us. We'll give you a link on our site. And it kind of makes me feel dirty because <laughs> they had all that money to make that movie, that production. And they're saying, hey, we'll give you free adversity. Yeah. <laughs> so sorry, you just sent me down a great rabbit hole of why don't we do this? I may need more yeah, sleep. I hear that. Wouldn't that be wonderful if the, the, some of the producers out there thought in that direction, you know, like hey, you know, for every dollar I spend on this, I'm going to go fund somebody's research or or yes. um, fund CosmoQuest um, or fund a space mission. Yeah. So I would like to, to give so, a, a small thank you, though, to the entertainment industry as well, because so many, <laughs> many, many of them are actually working very hard to try to tell an accurate story of space yes. exploration. And they are also working with many of us to try to help get the word out about the real science and engineering behind that and to inspire people to want to get involved and do all that hard work that our other superheroes were just talking about that, that is behind really coming to understand the science and the engineering and, and you know, the, the art that's needed to turn an idea into a concept 
all those different challenges. And so, and we, I, uh, one of my other superpowers is to run a nonprofit as well. And we are very interested in integrating science and music and literature and, and film with space. <laughs> We, we have our own array of dogs here as well. <laughs> Sorry, those are my minions. Yeah, mm -hmm. space. It's, it's, it's all right. The funny thing was uh, when one of our uh, uh, graduated uh, astronomy cast Cosmic Quest team members, I believe, just arrived upstairs. And so I hear dogs going off upstairs. And so I had this moment of how did a microphone upstairs like get hooked into the stream? So it's good to know there's dogs going off in all corners of the universe. <laughs> there are dogs everywhere. Yes. Mm. <laughs> so anyway, um, I, I, I agree to a certain extent with what you're saying. We do need a greater investment in exploration, the technology and the science and everything we need, the tools we need to do the exploration that we're all interested in doing. But there is also a connection with the entertainment industry that we should still value and help foster because they're also doing us a really excellent service, especially those who are taking the time to really understand what's real. And I see a dog in your location <laughs> as well. This is actually space dog hour, I can tell. <laughs> Sorry, I unmuted. So and Andreas Plazas, who is one of our streamers of old, has just arrived. You can't see him because he's on the other side of the camera. And he's currently being growled at by Malachi, who's afraid of men. Um, and now trying to remove my stream deck. It's okay, Malachi. Um <laughs> <laughs> and Eddie has a dog bone. Chaos has occurred. If you come around this way, you can yes. wave at the camera and I'll figure out how to get audio out. Okay. Or I can wait upstairs or whatever. Yeah. So, wait, so, wait, wait, wait. yeah, no. stick your head in. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so, so you're welcome to grab a chair, hang out. Um, Sure, I do feel like I need to give a shout out actually to um, we have a bunch of other superheroes that were not able to make it today. Um, Flair, who um, studies particles from the sun, um, uh, the Marvelous Martian, who um, is actually um, one of the controllers of curiosity. Um, who else do we have? Um, um, oh, right. Oh, my gosh. Our engineer. We only have one engineer so far. This is very sad. We need more engineers. OK, um, but she is. Um, uh, um, 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 Valkyrie, right. Um, and um, um, who else? Oh, Tefra, who studies volcanoes. Yes. So unfortunately, they are out, you know, using their superpowers to save the world at this time and couldn't join us. And I, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think our Facebook page is the female, is female superheroes of science? Yes. Or is it the female superheroes? I think it's just female superheroes of science. So come join us. We would love to expand our group. And from anywhere in the world, any of you who are out there, you know, come join us in our, our amazing mm -hmm. different ways of exploring space. And so I've shared the so link much. out uh, so everyone can see the link. Thank and, you. And do you guys get to go out and... Uh, battle ignorance in in public spaces where people might be able to witness your awesomeness? Well, one of the most important things we try to do is, is talk to young people who are still trying to decide. They're trying to understand what their superpowers are and how they're going to apply them and what they want to study. So one of the main things we do, and I think all of us that are on right now have really made an effort to help educate young students, but we are happy to do more and different types. I think, uh, why don't you talk about um, Comic Palooza? Yeah, so um, our first time that we um, that we made a, a public appearance and declared ourselves and you know let people know our secret identities was at Comic Palooza here in Houston. Um, and um, uh, we, we were a panel of, of four of us. And um, we came back again the following year, and hopefully we're going to be on again this coming year. Um, and we've also done 
um, where we, there's a, um, there's a, um, for, well, actually it's like, I think four, third and fourth grade or something um, in, in um, Baytown, Te uh, Texas, because this is like the area that, that we live in at least. Um, yeah. And we've gone to that school and on their, they have an annual space day where they get astronauts and other engineers and, you know, and such. And so we, we came and um, Comet Girl was the most popular one there. <laughs> well, that time I had green hair. I'm in disguise, so you cannot see it now. But um, yeah, people, students were asking uh, questions like, uh, why do you have green hairs? And uh, why do you look so strange? Things like that. <laughs> so we had a we had a great deal of fun. Um, I so I think purple. it was a lot of sorry. Yes, I have purple. Does this mean I'm turning into a superhero? Probably. You, yeah. You've been a superhero as long as we've known you and probably long before then. What do you mean? But but I need to go find a costume. That I is think, true. I think, I think you have one. Or and if you me. need any help, I she know someone is great. <laughs> really awesome. No, but seriously, I, I would love to get involved with you as a superhero and I'm not gonna lie I have an entire closet of costuming stuff perfect so I I um communicating science is is one of those things that there's so many different ways to do it and I I love to go to science fiction fantasy conventions to communicate science because let's face it stormtroopers clearly need to learn science their yeah. aim is terrible they don't understand light they're trying to aim up as though it were a bullet gravity doesn't affect light as quickly because the velocities are different they need help yeah. and and so I've spent a lot of time trying to help the stormtroopers and the the fats and and all the others who appear at at Arisia, at Dragon Con, at a lot of these other conventions out there. And one of my favorite things to do with Arisia, because it's a January convention, is to go um to the best science of the year panel in a costume that's inspired by the best science of the year. And one of my favorite science stories was uh, two or three years ago, there was the discovery of a um, female Viking warrior buried in warrior honor fashion. And so I have a Viking woman warrior costume with everything but the axe, and that's just because those are hard to get through TSA. <laughs> and and so by by going into these other spaces, and the chat is saying Star Strider is a perfectly good superhero name. Um, sure. <laughs> by going into these other spaces and coming to people in the places where they are, we can pull them into science where they might be expecting to go and talk about Babylon 5, the runaways, whatever is the fiction of the moment. And we can say, let us introduce you to the fact. What, what have been your favorite hmm. moments of bringing science to people in unusual places? Hmm. That's a good one. I have to think about that one a minute. Anybody? Hmm. So actually, okay, I got one. It was the first time I was ever, um, I ever did Comic Palooza and it was before I, when I was still, my secret identity was still a secret. Yeah. Um, so I actually came as Georgiana Kramer, scientist, and I gave this talk about the lunar swirls, which I am absolutely in love with. Um, and it was actually based on a science talk about them that I've, that I've given. So this was a very intense talk now, you know, the audience was, it wasn't a full, completely full auditorium or, you know, or room that they had for me, um, but there was a really decent number of people that came and only one person left during the talk, you know? And I mean, I have to say, I can't blame them because all yeah. those people that stayed are superheroes themselves because, you know, looking back on it, that was a very intense science rich uh, talk. And if you didn't have the background or at least some geology or something, I, I was really impressed with the, that they, they followed it. They came back at me with questions that, um, you know, a lot of people, they, they were a bit overwhelmed, but we, we got through it. Um, and so that was actually really inspirational to me that, that these, these people who came to Comic Palooza, 
they chose to come and to see my talk that was a science talk and then they got a really heavy heavy science talk and they stayed yeah. and they 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 worked hard to understand it it was great so what's behind us george behind us are some lunar swirls <laughs> it's right here it's like it's the top this is a mountain right here lunar swirls up here that so, that is amazing and, I, and I i have to agree with george one of the most amazing things is when people you know scientists have a bad reputation of not being able to talk to anyone other than themselves you know we forget right. our base vocabulary right they and so it's awesome that people like you and 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 us here are changing that impression by being able to talk about science in a way that that everyone can relate to, you know, really using, because they're all smart. They just may not know the vocabulary that we tend to use when we talk to each other. And then they get super excited and they're so thankful. And then they're really excited about space and they want to, and the, at the end of these presentations, they all want to know what can I do to help? And so it's just, it's a small change on our part. Yeah. And everyone's really feeling folded in. And I think that's one of the most satisfying things about what we do. Yeah, I really enjoy every time when I go talk about science. Um, I went to uh, talks like comic, uh, comic cons or down to school talks or to uh, uh, astronomical society talk. And the age group you can see is from basically babies to, 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 you know, all age group, really. And the amazing thing really is to see how people, basically everyone who we talk science to are interested in science in some sense. You would thought maybe there are people who are less interested in science. Maybe people are more interested in art in some other, uh, some other way. But when you really talk about what you do and what's the interesting thing like for me for example I work in the laboratory and I study meteorite I powder them and extract organic molecules from them so I get to see space rocks every yeah. day so just by showing people space rock they will have millions of questions to ask about the solar system about how they travel to to earth things like that so it's interesting and it's really satisfying to share with people all these strange questions and, and uh, discuss with them. Because sometimes even children, small children, like the one that we went to uh, in, the, in the space day, they would ask me questions that I had to actually go out and, and, and discover again. Because there's just so many things that we don't know. And it's just so fun to explore them together. So I really enjoy every time when I talk science to people. And we're all lucky that Jane, the future Thor, introduced us to mm -hmm. the idea that any of us can become the most powerful people in the universe. Captain Marvel's out there, fighter mm -hmm. pilot. But even with these role models, and especially Jane, who's a PhD astrophysicist, um, people still aren't used to scientists is that they meet in the wild, especially not women scientists. I, I know I, I had a particular moment where uh, outside of Houston, I was prepping for a Renaissance fair. I was actually hanging out in a barn with a jousting troupe where the horses were horses I helped take care of. And one of the jousters was like, so what do you do? Um, and I told him I'm a PhD student in astronomy at University of Texas. And he's like, no, really, what do you do? <laughs> and this went on for about four hours before the barn owner finally was like, dude, dude, she's actually an astronomer. Wow. Do, do you find that people are like, no, this is just your cosplay. Who are you really? I have, yeah, I for I example, have uh, so I'm from Morocco. Um, I, um, so I've been recognized in Morocco because I was the first female uh, Moroccan to work for NASA. Uh -huh. And I was a postdoc at NASA, and so I got a lot of attraction, um, a lot of interest in my work, and I had a lot of interviews. And for example, recently I've done a video interview, and, and uh, yeah, and so whenever you talk to the public, that's you know you have to like um, let yourself be yourself, right? Because yeah. people. Ex 
expected to measure some just talk equations and things like that. And so, um, for, and so for example, so you have to be like really, um, like you're talking to your grandma or your kid. And so I had some questions, for example, is flat, is earth flat? And why is it flat really? And so the problem is like, whenever whenever you're with, within scientists, yeah, whenever someone asks a question, you just laugh and you just like roll in eyes, but you have to like be really super, just very accepted. It's like someone, someone just living and, um and in a complete other life another perspective and so you yeah. just have to be calm and just answer and not be scared of oh i'm uh, other scientists i get them think this interview is really stupid or <laughs> <laughs> or right and so also uh, as a, as a female um from an arabic country um i had um so people ex and i'm a scientist and people really think that i'm always working all the time I'm just, I never have fun, you know, if you want to be a scientist and you have to like just kill all your life and just do nothing else but working. And no, that's, that's wrong. Look at me, this is, my hair is actually real hair. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Sidib, I, hey, I do have saying? blue hair like that and it's real. And, and so for me, when I gave this video, I really had to like, you know, show all of my country, hey, we do have fun as scientists. And yes. if I work hard, it's not because I've been forced to work hard. It's because I'm passionate about my work. I just do it because I love it. Yeah, and I, I have a blue hair. Maybe I'm like the first Moroccan female with crazy hair showing on TV. And everyone was watch watching at like 3,000 views. And every, I mean, and so the, the thing is that it was cool because for people who were like, oh yeah, she's a scientist, she had blue hair, she, she's crazy. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and so the thing is that we have to break all of these crazy uh, stereotypes that we have about science, about um, uh, studying and, and having fun and all of these things, you know, it's just all about passion, about how, the will, about really being being committed to what we want to do and just do it in very, I mean, with a lot of, with commitment and um, passion, and, uh, pa passion mm -hmm. and perseverance on that. That was the point. So it's, it's just all good. We just have to be, um, to accept where we are and just be calm and just talk and be creative and just let ourselves go. And that's all the kids. It's like, most of the time, like kids imagine scientists just doing equations and being yeah. like, you know, because they've been forced to do the math and not actually not actually thinking why math is so awesome. Because the problem is that we don't give them nice examples. Oh, we do math because we want to know what, how to send this satellite and not crash Earth. And so if you, we get to do that and go to schools and show all the cool science we do here, we do all of this math to understand what's happening here and maybe someday to communicate with other life beyond them. So it's just so, it's amazing. And to do that, it's just, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's all easy. We just have to be, to stop have, having the feeling of being judged because we're scientists and we're not supposed to talk about flat earth and blah, blah. And yeah, and so just be calm and passionate and just talk as a kid, the, the kid we were before when we were babies. And it's just us, yeah. And, and, and I agree also, we have to work hard to get rid of this image that scientists aren't creative because searching for knowledge and solving problems and it takes a tremendous amount of creativity and you have to, you have to really you have to be a very creative person. Some people like to say, well, there are scientists and then there are creative people. Well, that's ridiculous. Right. You are a much better scientist if you are also working hard to be creative and letting yourself be creative and, and trying new things and having a broad mindset. And so I totally agree. It's, it's the real stuff is not what some people think it is. Yeah, for some so of you out there that I say, oh, I, I couldn't do this because of math. Right. I math is difficult. I can't get through. I was I was actually the same way. I'm not going to pull an Einstein and say that I got, you know, C's in math. I mean, I actually like uh, failed algebra once and it was just because or it was algebra two, whatever it was. I was just like, this is this is too hard. This is pointless. And then I took an astronomy course and suddenly I saw how it was useful and how it was just a tool. And just seeing that made 
it easy. And I got A's and I went through calculus and everything. It was just, it just became this tool and it became really, I mean, easy for me is not the right way to say it. It's not like it became intuitive, but it just, I, I could use it. I could, it wasn't something that was a challenge. It was something I used. It wasn't so mm-hmm. scary. Yeah. And, and this is really one of the key things. We have to break down the stereotypes. There are people who do kinds of science that requires you to be a math genius. Some of the people who are doing theoretical models with particle physics, with gravity models, there, there's so many things that I look at their research papers and nope out hard and then read the executive summaries and the abstracts and the conclusions. But then there's also research that you can do like I do that is computer intense where you need that software background and you need to be creative in how you get the algorithms to work together. There are people that do their science through image processing and it's this mix of the visual arts and understanding geology that gets at these amazing results. And we're all interdisciplinary, we're all doing different things and we all have different strengths and weaknesses, but by working together, all of our individual superpowers allow us to understand this universe. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I think the uh, the science and um, boring equation, as we were just saying in the past five minutes, is, is really a misunderstanding how science is like. Because I think most of the time, for me to enjoy science, is really the story that, 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 that we're trying to figure out. So what what I'm doing in the lab is trying to answer a, a question and I could, so that I could tell a story to people. I do not need a, a, a really good grade in maths to be able to tell a story to people. But you will need maths uh, in some sense because that would make your story more accurate. That would make your story more convincing. So those are essential still. But uh, for me, the enjoyable part is to to unravel the story, to understand what that was all about, and be able to share the story with with every one of you. And and this is what we're doing. We're finding ways to share the story. Mm-hmm. And and I'd like to point out to folks out there who haven't approached theoretical physics papers. First of all, you may be saner for it. Second of all, there are boring equations. 2 plus x equals 4 is a boring equation. But the equations that exist in these papers, they are not boring. They are simply overwhelming, and there is a difference between the two. It's, it's the difference between a peanut butter and, sh- and jelly sandwich is a boring meal mm-hmm. and a Thanksgiving feast of all your family's traditional recipes combined in a new and amazing way when you have house guests. That is an overwhelming meal. They tell different stories. One will challenge you in every possible way, but it isn't boring. Mm -hmm. If for me, when I look at a really uh, um, calculation or math intensive paper, it's like the paper was written in English and Finnish. And um, it helps if I know someone who speaks Finnish that can maybe kind of do a little translating for me. Yeah. You know, I, I know a few words, mostly most of them are curse words, but, you know, I know a few mm-hmm. Finnish words, right, you know, but, but so I can kind of see some of it, but it, it helps um, to, to, to get a little assistance and also realize it, it's another language. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, well, that and- underscores what you said earlier about we need to put all of our superpowers together And we are so much more powerful when we work together. Everybody's got a talent, a superpower. Sometimes it takes us a while to find it. But once you do, then you can contribute and and we can figure out the best ways to work together and do awesome things. I I would like to say, so I study the moon, but most of the tool that I mostly use is called spectroscopy. And this means that I'm using different wavelengths of light and manipulating them to understand different compositions and such. Um, and so I know a little bit about optics and how light interacts with uh, surfaces and things. And, and, and But there are photographers and painters and graphical artists who understand color and pigment and such in ways that I will never get, you know, um, or, or at least I don't. And it's amazing. 
thing. And there's, I have this, um, this display of uh, specimens, they're a bunch of rocks. And I, I will, I've shown them to many people that have come in, even an astronaut. Um, and I, there's two of them on this display are not real rocks, they are man-made objects. And I challenge the people to find out which ones they are. Now, most people get one of them because it's one of these squishy foam rocks. So it kind of looks like somebody splattered paint on it because that's what happened, right? Um, but the other one is it's made out of plastic and it just looks like, like a, I don't know, like an old rock that's just been sitting there. And um, even the astronaut didn't get that one. <laughs> I thought this was a really good one. The first person and only two people have gotten both of them right on the first guess. The first person who got it right was a graphic artist. And I asked him, how did you know that? And he said, it just looked like the light wasn't bouncing off it right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, before That's we, superpower. I, I heard the tail end of it's the intuition and they were talking about artificial gravity. And I used to study artificial gravity with colleagues all over the world and the science because we're interested in possibly spinning vehicles or having little mini centrifuges on spacecraft to help simulate the forces of gravity on the human body and help keep them healthy. So there are different camps. Some people think you should have a mini centrifuge. Some people think you should spin the vehicle. Well, the concept of spinning the vehicle has never been real. And when people talk about it in these scientific meetings, they always show pictures of clips from the film, 2001, A Space Odyssey. So the, the power of, of visualizing things before they're real is an important thing to help people to have something common to talk about. And, 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 you know, even if it's not quite right, not quite realistic, it gives them something they can all share a visual image, uh, a different eye, a different appearance. And so they have to work collaboratively with the scientists and the engineers to get those images correct. But it is very interesting, the power of capturing something and working collaboratively. So, and, and I love the fact that once we get an image in our mind, that becomes the archetype, you cannot displace it. <laughs> uh, Babylon 5 to me is my favorite example of a rotating spacecraft that generates artificial gravity. And, oh. and it is almost never used in these examples. And there's some beautiful uh, moments in the series where it's acknowledged that in that center of the spinning cylinder, you still have zero gravity. And oh. I, it's just the trade-offs amuse me to no end. Now, in, in putting all of this together, um, I, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that our community has some superheroes in it that allow us to do science that couldn't be done otherwise. We have seven community members who mapped over 1,000 images on the asteroid Bennu, which is an asshole of an asteroid because <laughs> it is rocks on boulders with boulders on rocks and more rocks and boulders all Sounds loosely like held together by gravity flinging additional debris out at you and trying to find a safe pl place for the osiris Mex rex mission to dive down and take a sample required months of human effort compressed into it actually required years of human effort um, collapsed into months of time. And we did it. And those seven people have a superpower that is underappreciated. It wasn't just that they were good at marking rocks and measuring boulders. They, they were good at those things. It was that they had a perseverance, a work ethic, and a determination that when confronted with an image of 4,000 rocks, you're all like, okay, I'm on it. And they just marked every one of those stupid rocks. We all hate rocks now, by the way, all of us. <laughs> and, and so perseverance is, a, is part of being a scientist, that perseverance, that creativity. And, and all of these things need to come together. And, and the passion and the, the wanting to know things that we don't understand yet. And 
we do it together. Yep. You That's have what we do it best. <laughs> yes. Einstein was not a lone genius. He was writing letters back and forth with Dirac all the time, as well as many other individuals whose names completely do not come to my mind right now. <laughs> Scientists work together. And, and it's awesome to see all of you working together on all of this communications. Um, and Mike Cassidy, who is one of our Magnificent Seven, just won a copy of Free Wi-Fi on Mars, which is a graphical no novel that we produced a few years ago. Um, and I love that one of our Magnificent Seven just won a comic book. <laughs> Congratulations. That's awesome. So if people want to learn more about what each of you are doing individually, as well as uh, anything in addition to your Facebook group, I'm going to share out its link one more time. Where can people find you all on the internet? They'll have to use our real names, unfortunately. Tell them about Star Exchange. Oh, well, we, we do have uh, the, uh, you can start for me, you can start with the nonprofit SciArt Exchange and I can send that website, but I, and uh, that's, that's where we're really working together to foster science communication and, and creativity and teamwork, especially with the future of space exploration and you integrating science and engineering with all the different art forms. But uh, you can also look me up, I guess LinkedIn maybe would be a good place. And um, you can learn about how I'm a neuroscientist and very interested in the human body on long duration space missions. And I'm Jancy McPhee. And we can give all this information to Star Strider, who is now officially a member Woo! of the Female <laughs> Superheroes of Science. Welcome, Star Strider. Happy dance. Yeah. It's yes, this this is totally and your SciArt exchange, you may not I I paid planets. Like I don't have awesome. any of the big ones nearby, but like I earn part of my living now, a small part, um, as a artist doing space art. That is so. awesome. We will have to talk later. Yes, yes, all the things. I feel like I just found a new community that I need to like you did. And yes, and you you can help us grow it better than anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And, Thank you. And um, the rest of you might not know that Star Strider and I also worked together like five or six years ago to actually have a hangout about the moon so yes. that we could talk about um, set people straight on things about the moon. And and so there's no oil. Yeah. No. There's no oil. There's okay. helium three. And by the way, just helium balloons. Stop it. Okay, that's all. Yeah, <laughs> we're running out of helium. How? I mean, if you keep making balloons, how are we going to make high squeaky voices? <laughs> oh no, I mean science. How are we going to do science? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so so yeah, that was that was part of our Clea Moon uh, series that we did. Um, so much streaming, so much streaming, streaming for good. Um, so, so we're going to come forth and do many awesome things in the future. Um, but for now, I need to wind this hour down. We have two of our alumni from CosmoQuest are upstairs playing with my dogs, as the dogs want to be played with. Um, and we're going to bring them down and bring them on stream. Our next guest, I think, is going to be Laura Burns. Um, I'm confused. I'm happy though, so <laughs> it's okay. Um, and we're just gonna keep on bringing the science for another 12 hours. We have 12 Woo! hours remaining. You go. So are, <laughs> are you having that coffee on intravenous as well or, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> I What I particularly like is I have like, we. As adults, we get to choose our family. And some of my really close family um, is is stopping by this weekend on their way to visit others for Christmas. And they made amazing curry for dinner last night. And they made amazing bacon and eggs, which apparently is all it takes to make me happy this morning. And so I have people feeding me and they cleaned my kitchen. Wow. 
So that's how you know who your true family yeah. really is. Yeah. I'm sorry, I have to clean the kitchen. I know. Thank you, Wayne Johnson, for the bits. Thank you. You did bring me cookies. I did. <laughs> and well, our Canadian contingent, I'm going to show this off. We have four boxes of maple cream cookies, which are my wow. absolute favorite cookies. And these are the same cookies that flew on the International Space Station. Well, not these cookies did not go on the International Space Station, but this brand of cookies. So we have space cookies that also happen to have been, before they went into space, my favorite cookies. So I can't complain. Go Canada. Um, thank you, Keeper of Maps, for the bits and the sharing of the emotes. Thank you so much. Um, so go forth. Be awesome. I shall be joining your endeavors. My costume closet and I shall have a good stare at one another. <laughs> and... It has been a true pleasure to have you on Thanks this so past much. hour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here. <laughs> and I'm now to awkwardly realize I didn't queue up the next scene. Awkwardness, awkwardness. Almost ready to not be awkward. Okay, here we go. I will see you all later. All right. Hello, everyone. Andreas, Anya, if you're upstairs watching, come on.